So I'm going through this mental dilemma right now of do I just break into Don't Stop Believing or do I, do I not? And <laughs> Don't tease like that. So <laughs> All right, so uh, Bethany and I go way back. We met last week. Uh, but we, we were at Velocity, and, and I said hi, and I saw she was speaking here, which is awesome. Uh, she's just a small-town girl. I'm, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> here's Bethany. All right. Good morning. Hi, all. How is everyone? All right. All right, seven years ago in New York City, a startup was born. Paperless Post was launched in 2009 with the power of 20 artisanally crafted virtual machines. In these dark early days, there was no dedicated ops team and no server came to fruition without the power of our helpful friends at our managed hosting provider. Today, we have 500 virtual servers, 135 employees, 60 of which are engineers, offices in two countries, 500,000 daily visitors to paperlesspost.com, and a distributed operations team of six. Our entire server infrastructure is now captured in code, with parts of our infrastructure now fully orchestrated using Terraform. We're closer than ever to our long-standing dream of immutable infrastructure. This is a story of Paperless Post's journey from zero to infrastructure as code. In 2011, two ops engineers, including me, were hired to try to take this sad up time and try to turn it around. We enthusiastically set out to eliminate all hand-configured services. At this point, our stack was pretty simple. Ruby on Rails, Postgres, Redis, Memcache, Nagios, and Munin, some hopes and dreams. And building on some work started for us by contractors, we set out to create a chef cookbook for every service in our infrastructure. Because this was the early days of chef and there were few tools and workflows for collaboration, we rolled our own, taking inspiration from John Liv's knife spork tool. Using Git, Jenkins, and our own command line tools that we called dev tools, we took advantage of chef's cookbook versioning to upload and pen specific cookbook versions to environments. One of the biggest wins for getting all of our infrastructure into Chef was the ability to now require code review for any Chef change. Then using Chef's knife command line tool to integrate with our private vSphere cloud, we were able to use simple, concise commands like this <laughs> to create the servers that defined our infrastructure. We now had the first foundational layer in our journey towards infrastructure as code. Our mission of having no more hand-configured services was accomplished, but we still dreaded being on call because our site was constantly going down in the middle of the night because of things out of our control. One day, a data center engineer at our managed hosting provider tripped over a cable in the data center and caused a production outage. That is a true story. So after much deliberation <laughs> and research, we crunched some numbers, brokered sales, and landed ourselves a new managed hosting provider. So in the absence of any existing tools to orchestrate this migration, we created our own, building upon our existing Chef infrastructure. We updated our DevTools command line interface to integrate with Chef and vSphere APIs. PP Chef create node clones a node from template, bootstraps it using Chef. Chef takes it from there, registering the node in DNS, joining it to LDAP, and configuring monitoring. And PP Chef cleanup node removes it from vSphere, Chef, DNS, LDAP, and monitoring. We brought up over 200 servers in our new managed hosting provider's vSphere back private cloud using PP Chef create node, either by running the individual command or by wrapping it in shell scripts. The migration was complete one week before Hurricane Sandy, after which our old helpful hosting provider lost power and backup generators and was completely offline for five days. We celebrated our migration accordingly. Life was pretty good. 
We can now create and delete nodes at will and had good visibility into everything thanks to Sensu, Graphite, and some built-in house tools that integrated the Sensu alert, chef data, and Graphite metrics. With the migration behind us, we were now able to add a new layer to our infrastructure as code pyramid. A simple Jenkins job spins up a vSphere VM in our given, into a given role in our QA environment. And it's not the most sophisticated test, but it was at least a start. Fast forward a year, Paperless went on a hiring spree, bringing in herds of developers, data scientists, front-end gurus, all to help with international expansion and new products. Our Rails monolith was getting friends, lots and lots of friends. PP Chef Create Node was not scaling. And developers now had needs for different operating systems and languages. The time had come to end our two-party system. <laughs> Containers were a promising solution, but how could we introduce the concept into our familiar and deeply ingrained DevTools workflow? For example, all existing applications at Paperless Post, including Chef, are deployed in this manner, PP application deploy environment branch. DevTools get tags to the branch locally, pushes the branch to GitHub, and sends the deploy request to de deploy party, our front web end for deployment workflow. In addition to coordinating between DevTools and Jenkins, Deploy Party also displays information about branches, deploys, and builds for each application and environment. Our first implementation of containers, we chose Docker and worked it into our familiar DevTools Deploy Party Jenkins workflow. Each service has its own Docker file in the root of the application's GitHub repository. And when an application developer is ready to deploy her code to a given environment, she commits the code to her branch, and on her local machine, she invokes DevTools with this command. DevTools checks out her local branch, tags it, and pushes the tag back to GitHub. DevTools records the deploy in deploy party, and deploy party passes it off to Jenkins for execution. On Jenkins, the deploy script runs DevTools again with a local flag, which checks out the tag, builds the Docker image, and tags it with the git tag, and pushes the image to a re remote repository. Then DevTools queries the Chef API to determine the list of nodes to deploy to, and then using SSH, pulls the new container image onto each node and restarts the container via its systemd script. We run the Docker daemon on our base CentOS image on a single VM in vSphere or instance of EC2. Each instance of the Docker service runs three containers, an application container, a log spout container, and one Docker garbage collection container to clean up and remove unused images. So each container, rather than being scheduled by a clustering service like Kubernetes, is simply wrapped in a systemd script. The revision to pull is provided to the systemd script using a small Go app called current tag which integrates with the deploy party to serve as a local registry for tags. This unsophisticated implementation works for us for a few reasons. So it allowed us to use our existing deploy workflow to create new nodes using PPChef create node, but now we could build up Dockerized applications. It allowed our developers to use their familiar Git workflow to deploy and run their code on containers. And it gave our developers the power to choose the right language and operating system for the job at hand, while buying the ops team time to figure out the important details of what giving the developers the full keys to the castle would entail. So for installing and configuring Docker on the server side, we wrote a chef definition called Docker application. The Docker application definition handles several things. It installs the Docker service and starts it, configures and manages log spout, which captures all logging output from Docker's running containers. It installs and configures FileBeat, which ships those Docker logs exposed by log spout to our Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana stack. It creates systemd scripts to start each of the containers, and then it sets up Nginx port mapping and certificates for HTTPS. It also configures two basic Sensu checks, one is the container running, and is the service returning a 200 response on the slash health API endpoint. 
The Docker application can be used in two ways. Uh, first, in any cookbook, like here in our Kibana cookbook, or in a chef role called Simple Docker app that takes one attribute, the application name, and wraps the Docker application definition. In January of this year, our first Docker-based service shipped to production. Yay. <laughs> and we successfully added another level to our infrastructure as code pyramid. So surprisingly, it took about six years of paperless post existence before some clever users decided to use it as a spam platform. This was bad news for paperless post mail transport agent IP reputation. So what do you do when you have a sudden and urgent need to apply complicated logic to determine if your senders are legit or not? Our solution was to have one of our engineers whip up a Python classifier application and deploy it as a simple Docker app. Rainbozos is a service that takes in features about an event using machine learning libraries, outputs a classification on whether or not the event is spammy. So having the ability to rapidly develop and ship a brand new application into our infrastructure really saved our bacon. One might even say auto bacon. <laughs> so after a few years with our second managed hosting provider, things started going sour. Tickets were being neglected left and right, and in general, we were unsatisfied with not having control over the hardware that sat in front of our web infrastructure. We were already making good use of some Amazon Web Services, like EC2 and S3, so we decided that after taking a very close look at all of our options, it was time to pull the trigger on our long-standing dream of migrating completely to AWS. Side note, if you ever want to reinvigorate a team of ops engineers, tell them they get to abandon everything they're working on and focus completely on re-implementing your entire server infrastructure on a brand new platform. Try it. So deciding to migrate to AWS was the push we needed to implement some form of full orchestration. We had a whole new world of things that needed to be managed. Nodes, elastic load balancers, S3 buckets, RDS instances, VPCs, VPNs, users, everything. And we needed to pick something that played nicely with Docker and Chef. The solution we picked was Terraform. And our very first implementation of Terraform was a wrapper for our simple Docker app application stack. A Docker app module in our Terraform repository lets us define and build multiple applications in many environments. The module does the following. It creates the EC2 instances and bootstraps them into Chef. It creates the internal and external ELBs, and then creates a DNS entry for the Elastic Load Balancer. Amazon relational database service instances for these terraformed services are provisioned by a chef cookbook called Paperless RDS, which puts credentials in a data bag for sharing between the, the nodes. We plan for chef to continue handling RDS operations to protect those databases from an errant terraform destroy command. So using Terraform, we were able to put an ELB in front of one or more simple Docker app servers, all sharing an RDS instance. And this is a huge improvement over our old clunky way of deploying two HA proxy VMs sharing a virtual IP using KeepAlive D for every application. We've written a Terraform wrapper script called TF, um, which gives us a simple interface into managing the Terraformed apps in multiple environments. And then we use Terraform's remote state feature to, to allow our team members to collaborate on the repository. Now we're working on modules to manage all aspects of our infrastructure. Here, I've built a Chef 12 server behind an elastic load balancer using S3 for cookbook storage, 100% using Terraform. Previously, I needed a Chef server to build my Chef server, so this is pretty cool. And now we get a truly magical thing, which is code review for all aspects of our infrastructure, not just chef configurations. This is exciting. So, and with that, we have another layer in our infrastructure's code pyramid. Oh, sorry. Um, so with all radical changes in workflow and infrastructure, there are some pain points and things we've not figured out yet. Terraform still requires special credentials 
or at worst, an ops team member to manage. We're still getting a lot of requests asking us to create and delete stacks. Now the developers have the power of Docker and Terraform. They're spinning things up left and right, and sometimes in production. And sometimes before one might consider them production ready. So previously, ops owned all alerting and monitoring. We brought it up, so if it broke, we fixed it. And we naively configured Sensu to email us at one email address. And although some teams are really good about coordinating us with us about services, some just go for it. And we don't even know what this or that app is for. So our intermediate fix is to require an email address and PagerDuty team in the Terraform configurations as variables so that Sensu will only alert the necessary parties. So today, our tech stack looks a little bit like this. And our infrastructure consists of hundreds of vSphere nodes brought up using PPChef Create node, and then several Terraform full stack services that utilize AWS, Docker, and Chef. So what do we not have? I'm very sorry to say that we don't have mature Chef cookbook and role testing. We're still using the same Chef workflow we did in 2012, and it shows. We don't have any automatic node removal or regeneration or auto-scaling, and we don't have continuous Terraform module testing yet. So where are we going? AWS all the way and soon. We're working on more mature implementation of containers, including better coordination and scheduling. And we're forever trying to hire more ops and infrastructure engineers. Come work with me, please. So, and we're gonna keep reaching towards our dream of immutable infrastructure. So in summary, it's okay to make baby steps towards your goal of infrastructure in code. Don't fall into the trap of being overwhelmed don't stop believing and keep moving incrementally towards your goals. Our team's dream was immutable infrastructure, and we're getting closer to that every day. What's your team's infrastructure is code dream? Proceed carefully into the land of managed hosting. The more control you have over all parts of your infrastructure, network included, the better. And changing the culture of ask ops or get ops to do it is hard. So be patient and kind with your fellow engineers as they grow into their new role as the gatekeepers of not only their application code, but the servers they run on. Co-owning, alerting, and monitoring can be hard. But if you start routing alerts and create separate dashboards before you start letting the world bring up nodes in production, you'll thank yourself later. And finally, giving a 15-minute talk Summarizing the entire journey of your infrastructure and team is very, very revealing. Take some time to reflect upon and document and celebrate your team's story, and you'll learn a lot about where you're going and where you need to be. Thank you.